when we learn about Jewish history, we learn there's a series of movements and expulsions. Jewish civilization rose and fell in different locations, and we learn that Jews moved. What's really remarkable, though, about the Holocaust, about this particular um, persecution and its aftermath, is how much Jews cared about their stuff, about their libraries, about their Torah scrolls, and even about their looted property, their precious works of art that they had collected. There's something very modern about seeing Judaism or Jewish identity in a library, right? And that idea of a Jewish patrimony is something that had grown up, you know, in the early part of the 20th century. And it's why Jews like Hannah Arendt and so many others got invested in going back to get these Jewish things. Jews were many, many different things by the time of World War II. So you didn't have a common set of stories or even beliefs anymore about what made Jews Jews. And the kind of material things of Judaism, you know, that's one of the things across all the different denominations or different ideologies that Jews had. The stuff came to matter so much more. So Jews really cared about property that had been looted from Jews, and they really thought that this was the backbone of Jewish existence. We think of the Nazis as destroyers of culture, and of course they were. But book burning is too simple a story to tell about the Nazis. The Nazis were fascinated by the Jews. They were single-mindedly interested in the Jews. Anti-Semitism was the core of Nazi ideology. They did burn some books, and they did destroy a lot, but they were also modern people very concerned with justifying what they were doing through study. So the Nazis actually developed a science of Jewish studies. It's perverse, but they did. They wanted to study the Jews on the basis of their own texts. So many, many Jewish books were actually preserved and brought to libraries in Germany. Not everything, much was destroyed, but the Nazis, in fact, amassed the largest Jewish library that had ever been amassed in order to study the enemy, um, which they wanted to do in a scientific way based on the Jews' own words. During the war, this group of Jewish intellectuals in New York around Salo Baron and Koppel Pinson and Hannah Arendt, they became aware that looting was happening, that Jewish libraries and other cultural institutions were being emptied by the Nazis, and those books were being centralized. The Nazis had a plan for them, which was to bring them to an institute for the study of the Jews, which was going to be in Frankfurt. So many, many books were brought there where they were housed in what was already a library, the Rothschild Library. So when the Allies were fighting the Nazis and making their way across Germany in the spring of 1945, they found this big collection in Frankfurt. It's at the same time that they're finding other caches of Nazi loot in other places, like many of the paintings that this exhibit shows, right, are being found in other places in Germany. They weren't shocked. They had heard about it. And in fact, in 1943, the Allies had met in London and all except the Soviets had pledged themselves to return everything possible. So as they became aware of the scope and they started to stumble on looted libraries, looted art, and other types of loot, they broke it up and moved it to what they called collecting points. It was from these various collecting points in different parts of Germany that they were gonna start their restitution operation. They created Offenbach Archival Depot as the place from which they were going to return books, archives, precious manuscripts, and also Jewish ceremonial objects that had come from synagogues. One of the things that's important to understand about European Jews before the war is how important cultural life and intellectual life was in Europe. You know, for Jews, thinking about the future of the Jewish people really centered on having an educated elite of writers and artists 
one of the stories we always tell about um, rescue efforts during World War II is that priority was given to Jewish cultural leaders. The idea was, if Jews were to have a future, the cultural elite were really important. And with them, you need the libraries. You need the things that they're going to work from. So thinking about these objects and the recovery of these objects or what was happening to cultural institutions, it wasn't separate from a concern about what was happening to Jewish people. This is thinking about the future of Jewish life. And for the religious objects as well, how can there be religious life without Torah scrolls? So all of this concern for finding the loot is connected to their thinking about the future of the Jewish people. So the objects that we're talking about, which is the objects that wound up in the Offenbach Archival Depot, were of several different types. One group of objects was over a thousand Torah scrolls that had been looted primarily from synagogues and kind of brought together in terrible condition. There were also ceremonial objects, mostly also from synagogues, like pointers, the various dressings that you would put on a Torah. You know, Jews always adorn the Torah. It is an object of great veneration. And so there's all sorts of silver that Jews put on these Torahs, and those too were looted. Beautiful, beautiful works of art, and many of them wind up in Offenbach Archival Depot. The biggest set of materials, though, was from Jewish libraries, so books. By the time that they were all collected together, Offenbach Archival Depot had three million books. And they came from different types of institutions. So there were Jewish libraries that had been built up in synagogues. There were Jewish libraries in seminaries. And these were German collections. So much of what was found and recovered and wound up in Offenbach was from German collections. But there were also things that were found in Jewish libraries outside of Germany. So we're talking about kind of Jewish public libraries, if you will, Jewish research libraries, but also Jewish religious libraries that had been looted by the Nazis as part of their rampage across Europe. We always focus on the aspect of the final solution that was about destroying Jewish people, that is to say, murder. But there's also a cultural element, destroying Jewish libraries, destroying Jewish cultural life, destroying Jewish religious life was also part of the genocide. Initially, when the Monuments Men division was set up by the American authorities, they knew they would need librarians. So they actually, there were librarians among the Monuments Men. They were, might not have been the most glamorous, but they were a part of the operation. However, at first, when dealing with these books, it wasn't clear to the authorities who exactly they needed. The Offenbach operation was staffed by people who really weren't qualified for the task because they didn't know Jewish languages, so they knew how to deal with books. But when they looked at these books, the majority of them were in Hebrew, or they were in Yiddish, or they were in East European languages, and most of the staff was unable to help. So in early 1946, the Monuments Men brought in a man named Colonel Seymour Pomerantz, who actually had been working at the National Archives. And Colonel Pomerantz was especially qualified. He was European born. He was a refugee himself. He was Jewish. He had a degree in Jewish history, and he knew lots of languages. So that really turned things around at Offenbach Archival Depot. When Colonel Pomerantz left, he was replaced by Captain Isaac Bankowitz. He too was a European-born Jew. He was a native speaker of East European languages, including Yiddish. He also spoke Russian. So it was these men who really turned things around at the Archival Depot and with their special knowledge were able to really get the restitution operation going. We have testimonies that were left behind by some of the staff in Offenbach Archival Depot so we do know how some of these Jewish librarians felt about the work that they were doing. And for all of them, they report what an incredibly powerful experience this was. 
Bankowitz wrote in his diary, there's something sad and mournful about these volumes, as if they were whispering a tale of yearning and hope long since obliterated. I would pick up a badly worn Talmud with hundreds of names of many generations of students and scholars. Where were they now? Or rather, where were their ashes? In what incinerator were they destroyed? I would find myself straightening out these books and arranging them in the boxes with a personal sense of tenderness, as if they had belonged to someone dear to me, someone recently deceased. Once the staff in Offenbach had people who could read the scripts or the languages that the books were written in, some of the stuff was actually quite identifiable because of book plates. Within the first six months after Pomerantz and then Bankowitz got there, two million of these volumes were identified and returned. But there were two groups of books that were really tough. The stuff that just had no markings in it or where the markings were not um, identifiable by the staff. And of course, things that came from Eastern Europe, most of the staff, um, and if you think about it, it makes sense, they presumed that the owners of these books had been murdered, you know, given the scale of what had happened in Eastern Europe. But there was another problem, too, that concerned many of the librarians working at Offenbach and also many of these Jewish intellectuals back in New York who were very aware of what was happening. And that was, you know, this was the very beginning of the Cold War. And there was a lot of concern about what might happen should these libraries that had been looted from Eastern Europe, what if they were returned? The Soviet Union would have been happy to receive them but it wasn't clear that they would then be accessible to Jews from the West, given the growing tensions. So on these things, on these million books, really uh, the Americans were not sure what to do. So everyone who went in there was aware of this huge problem. They had this great idea, which was to take photographs of all the book plates that they weren't able to identify and make a book of these book plates and circulate them to Jewish communities to see if anyone knew what they were. So they used publicity as a way to try to do more restitution. That turned up some things, but mostly not, and they knew they needed to work quickly. The other thing that went on was some behind-the-scenes diplomacy. So there was a group of, as I've mentioned, Jewish intellectuals based in New York around an organization that was called the Conference on Jewish Relations. I should say that the Conference of Jewish Relations was founded in 1933 to do kind of Jewish scholarship that would counter Nazi anti-Jewish propaganda. So this group had been around for a little while. It had founded a scholarly journal. So these people were very up on the conversations that were going on about the Nazi loot, and they sent emissaries to Washington to advocate for a different path for restitution. What they feared most of all was that these books, once the Americans got to the end of their restitution operation, that what they couldn't find the rightful heirs for they would just leave in German libraries. People like Hannah Arendt, who was a refugee from Germany, she had left herself in 33, this repulsed her. This was the worst thing that could possibly happen to leave these things in the hands of the perpetrators. Others were really worried about things being sent to countries that had no more Jews left. So they were basically advocating for a different path and they were doing that at the highest levels of diplomacy. By 1947, they had succeeded, and they had convinced the State Department to put that airless property, right, that is to say, the books and other objects for which the original owners could not be found, to hand it over not to the countries from which they had been looted, but to a Jewish organization based in New York, and that organization was called Jewish Cultural Reconstruction. So Hannah Arendt was a German-born philosopher. She had gotten a PhD in Germany as a young woman in the 1920s. And then when the Nazis came to power in 1933, she emigrated first to Paris and then after the Nazis invaded France. She's one of those Jewish intellectuals rescued and came to New York. She always had her eye on what was happening in Europe. She was very aware of the Nazi threat. 
she is the one who during the war was really tracking what was going on with Jewish cultural property. And of course, the hope there was to give these lists to the Allies so that they could look for them after the war. Arendt had the very tough job of going around and convincing German officials and also many surviving Jews that Jewish books and archives that had survived the war intact needed to be handed over to Jewish cultural reconstruction to go to new homes. Hannah Arendt wrote in 1946 in her tentative list of Jewish cultural treasures in Axis-occupied Europe, in view of the wholesale destruction of Jewish life and property by the Nazis, reconstruction of Jewish cultural institutions cannot possibly mean mechanical restoration in their original form, or in all cases, to their previous location. Ultimately, it may seek to help redistribute the Jewish cultural treasures in accordance with the new needs created by the new situation of world Jewry. What she's saying is, after the war, we're gonna rebuild Jewish life, but it's not gonna be able to be in Europe. Jewish things need to come out of Europe. And what we see in those field reports is just what a difficult, difficult endeavor that was, how devoted she had to be to that, and how necessary she thought it was for the future of world Jewry. One of the metaphors that was really, really motivating for people involved with Jewish cultural reconstruction is the metaphor of Jewish books being just like orphans. Here I wanna to read to you a quotation from Rabbi Bernard Heller, who was the field director for JCR based at Offenbach. So he was the one going to Offenbach to get the books that were gonna be distributed in the world. He wrote, the repatriation of the identifiable books and articles resembled the return of kidnapped children to their former homes and the embrace of overjoyed parents who awaited them. The remaining unidentified books seemed like children whom the shock of war deprived of the power of recollection and awareness of identity. Even if they could manage to shake off the mentally petrifying grip of their amnesia, they would be confronted with the fact that the lands from which they came are now ravaged and their homes are demolished and their parents who would rejoice at their return are now no more alive. To these books and holy objects, the silent and stunned waifs of a horrible tragedy, we came not merely as a solicitous friend, but to provide them with a secure home and loving foster parents. The book distribution effort was just like an orphanage. It was the care for helping these books grow up into new cultural institutions in new places, right? It was the future of the Jewish people. There were a lot of divisions among Jews coming out of the war that involved some struggle over where things should go. So even among those who agreed with Hannah Arendt that Jewish stuff did not belong in Germany anymore, the question was, where should they go? Jewish cultural reconstruction wound up distributing this airless property in Jewish libraries in North America, primarily. So that is to say synagogue libraries, but also major Jewish research collections, such as the library at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York was a major recipient. So was the Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary, right? They both received lots and lots of books from Jewish cultural reconstruction for reasons that have to do with their idea of where the Jewish future was. By the end of the work of Jewish cultural reconstruction, institutions in Israel, this organization worked through 1952, many organizations in Israel also received airless property. And that was also, right, the idea that these are the two main places where Jews are going to be living in the future. Other countries too, libraries in South Africa, in South America, in Australia, also received a lot of these airless books. One place that didn't receive as many books was Europe itself. And this was a source of some bad feeling. I think British Jewry would have liked to get more books than they did. French Jewry, which had survived the war with their institutions, though there were many, many losses of people, would have expected to receive more books than they did. And that's because the powers at play did not believe there was a future for Jews in Europe. 
What's really powerful about Afterlives as an exhibition is the way that it not only shows what was recovered, but it tells the story of that recovery. It shows all of the investments that were made, in a way starting with the Nazis, who somehow, out of sheer perversity, preserved these things for their own nefarious ends. When I think about all the Jews who participated in these recovery efforts, people like Hannah Arendt or Gershom Sholem or the Holocaust historian Lucy Davidovich, who was also very involved, they surrounded themselves with these terrible, terrible stories and this very difficult task of calling Jewish life in Europe, which they had treasured, right? That is where they came from calling it over and working hard to salvage the cultural remnants out of it and taking it to new homes. But I think that work to try to restore what was broken and make it whole again is a hopeful act because in it, they are thinking that there is a Jewish future to make new libraries for and to bring art back or to recover Torah scrolls and bring them to museums or even to new congregations. It's like going back to the work of Jewish social workers to work with Jewish orphans, right? It's not gonna be in the same place, but there will be a Jewish future. Thank you.